Hello, everyone. Welcome to Queerly Recommended, the podcast where we recommend queer books, films, TV shows, and more. I'm Chris Bryant, a contemporary romance writer for Bold Strokes Books, and this week I'm recommending a sapphic romance. I'm Tara Scott. I review sapphic fiction at the Lesbian Review and Smart Bitches Trashy Books, and this week I am recommending a romance novel that features two men. Yay! As always, just want to take a minute to thank everyone who supports us through our coffee, through our uh, Substack, which is where we have our newsletter. Uh, we have links to both in the show notes. You can do paid subscriptions on Substack if you're inclined, if you're able, if you're not able, absolutely okay. Um, but of course, the other thing we always say is if you do want to do one more thing, just, you know, tell a friend. If Even if you don't say check out every episode, like, Maybe you really like the idea of something that Chris or I recommend today. Just send that one episode. That would be super helpful because we're here to just keep bringing that positive queer media representation in this hellscape of a world. <laughs> it was our original mandate because we started during COVID and it hasn't really changed because the world is not amazing, but positive it queer is representation <laughs> is amazing. It is. <laughs> All right. So I haven't been very busy, but Chris, you have. What's been I happening? I have been swamped. I forgot to tell you, I had pride. We have pride. And hey. I did a booth. I did a booth in Kansas City with my fellow Casey author, KB Draper. Nice. And also Christina Rivers came down from Chicago. And so we Ooh. had this booth for three days. And let me tell you, on Saturday, this mm -hmm. is awful. Okay. So Saturday, it was so hot and there was some of the people behind us put up like this massive display. And so there was no circulation for air, like on our Ooh. side of the tent. And we were sweat dripping. Like it yeah. was just, it, it was awful. And I feel really bad because I had this reader come up and she's like, I'm your biggest fan. I think you're amazing. And I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. And she's like, can I get a picture with you? And I said, absolutely not. Cause like I, looked like I just ran a marathon uh -huh. and I was just disgusting. Like, it was funny because the, the uh, a news team came through and they wanted to talk to us and we're all like, no, every single one of us were like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was, we were just disgusting, you know? Yes. And then Sunday was great. Sunday, there wasn't, you know, the, a big storm came through Saturday night and it really cooled everything down. So Sunday was a great day. So, mm -hmm. but we had pride and, uh, pride in Kansas city. Uh, just the event alone is three days. That's huge. It is huge. So we had to, we had to set up Thursday night. So I went down there and set up Thursday night and then, uh, and then it started on Friday from five to nine and mm -hmm. then all day Saturday and all day Sunday. So it was a very long weekend, but I love my friends and it was nice to hang out with them for a while. So that was really sweet. Do you find that because you're in like, let's be honest, quite a conservative state? Yes. Do you find the tenor of pride is changing or anything like that? Um, I feel like I feel like last year there were more people than this year. I feel like they're a lot younger, which is great. I want the young mm -hmm. queers to come out. And I did, yeah. you know, tell everybody about Clearly Recommended. Uh, the people who, oh, look, books, like they didn't even know that books, that queer books existed. Mm -hmm. And I just, I feel like, I feel like because Missouri is so conservative, like everybody brought their freak flags, like big Amazing. time. It was awesome. It was awesome to see these, uh, these queer people just like expressing themselves. Mm -hmm. And it was so cool to see. And I actually had somebody uh, from work come out. Hey, that's great. Yeah. And so, and of course, you know, they were like, what? Cause very young, very young, had no, oh, yeah. no concept of city life and just how people can be at, when they feel that they're in a safe space, like just mm -hmm. how original people are. And it was great. I loved it. I absolutely loved everything about it. Except that's the fucking so weather. That was awful. Yes. That was like a bitch. <laughs> like that was my only complaint was just that. Mm -hmm. So that's fair. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Um, yes. I have a friend who is a journalist and she went to, she was writing, I think it was a piece for BBC and it was about Miami pride. And it was something about like, 
it's so early though and i was like yeah dude it's miami do you it's like yeah. hot as balls in miami can you imagine drag queens in that heat it's july like, they're gonna melt to death they're gonna yeah. drag queens are gonna die a heat stroke and we are not here for that <laughs> yeah i mean it, it really was it was it was horrific i haven't been that hot in a very long time and yes, I'm getting older. I get that. But also, I mean, I, I sweat a lot to begin with. I'm just yeah. a sweater. Yeah. It was just hard. And everybody was like, we were all dying. It wasn't just me. I wasn't just being like overly like, no. oh, it's, yeah, oh, it's so bad. Now I was, I tried really hard not to. And I felt really bad for the reader who was just so excited to meet me. And I, and I really tried to, to spend time with them. And, and then I just couldn't do the picture because I was a, I was okay. This is how bad it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it was so bad. I had my hair up. I normally don't put my hair up. Yeah. Um, just because it was, and I was just literally, I was dripping. It was just mm -hmm. disgusting. So I had my banner behind me. Okay. And yeah. they're like, is Chris Bryant here? I'm like, wow, thanks. That's how bad it was. <laughs> <laughs> they did not recognize oh, me. No. I know. I was oh, like, oh, buddy. And they felt so bad about it. And I'm like, it's okay. Because I don't look like myself in that picture. Mm -hmm. um, just because my hair was up. I didn't have my glasses on. I mean, I could have been anybody. Yeah. So, just trying so to we were all laughing right. about that. <laughs> uh, let's see what else. I know we talked about the ERP Expo in Buffalo. I was going to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did go to it. I went to it. Yay. Yay. Uh, How was it? It was very long. Tag and Shepard and I, we spent three days selling books. Uh, I mm -hmm. think we did okay. But I got to meet uh, a couple of my friends, which is really nice. I got to have lunch with Kat. Hello, Kat. Great. I know you listen. Yay. And then Kathy came up and uh, I had like snacks and drinks with, with Kathy, my friend Kathy. So, and that I, was I nice. thought I saw a photo of you with your friend Tim Rose on. Oh, yes. Tim, my, <laughs> my, my almost boyfriend, Tim. Yes. Yes. If we you're did. Gonna have we a boyfriend, it's Tim. <laughs> I know if I'm going to have a boyfriend, it's him. For sure. Did he pick up another book? Uh, you know, he didn't pick up a book. And I don't know, like he he did go around and buy stuff. And this is the first time he's not bought something from me. And I blame Tegan Shepard 100%. I'm just uh, kidding. <laughs> did he buy something really from her? Did. No, he didn't. He skipped our table altogether. So I don't oh. know. I don't, you know, we were also loud and proud and in their faces type thing. And it mm -hmm. wasn't as big as I expected it to be. Like the one in Ohio was bigger several mm -hmm. years ago. But also the show is over. And yeah. so I feel like Buffalo is not an easy place for the world to get to. No. Um, it is not. Yeah. So the attendance level was like half of what it normally is, in my opinion, maybe even more so. But yeah, so I got to, uh, I did get to, to meet Tim again and to say hi. You know, he still remembers me, which is nice. That's nice. nice. I think he's very good and knows his fan base very well. Yeah. And then one night I walked to Canada. Hey. I crossed the border. I crossed the border and and it was so funny because I know nothing about when you walk across a border. I don't mm -hmm. know. I've never done it. So I get there and I'm the only one in this place. And the Canadian person was like, Why are you here? And I was just like, Because I was in New York. I just thought I'd walk across the border and say, okay, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I was really I stayed close to the border because I didn't know if they closed. <laughs> Oh, I mean, you no. know, I never, I, I, I <laughs> like the pedestrian no. side of it. I mean, they don't turn the sign at night. <laughs> Close, <laughs> turn off fuck off. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I mean, I know that they drive, you know, but I just didn't know if the sure. pedestrian side was closed. Uh, I, you know, I, it's I a valid know. question. I think it is. And so here's, so I went to Hard Rock Cafe because it literally was right across the street. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, hey, does the pedestrian walkway close? And, and she's like, I have no idea. So I don't feel so bad because mm -hmm. the Canadian who works there, like 10 feet from the border was like, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, well, you might be the first person who's asked. Probably. Maybe. Mm -hmm. So I went and I bought some really weird Canadian money and I gambled because there's a casino right there. It's like casino right across the street. So I was like, oh, I'll, I'll just go to Canada and play some really bad video poker, or video games. And it was horrible. And I lost money and your money feels weird. I don't like it. It does. They... It's super slick. Yeah. 
it's weird i don't there's like, like it there's like some all. kind of a plastic or something in it i can't remember how long ago it changed i'm old enough that it feels recent but i also know it does it's not recent oh <laughs> uh, yeah it's like most of my life it wasn't like that it could but have been, been 10 years like that for, yeah exactly 15. <laughs> yeah yeah i did much. not like the feeling i was like oh <laughs> it's just I'm a texture person and it uh, it bothered the shit out of me. <laughs> so. I don't really carry cash with me, so I don't think about it very much. Mm -hmm. I just use my cards at, like I use my debit card everywhere, but that's hilarious. <laughs> but when you gamble, you can't. You have I, to when you gamble, you have to use money. Actual I don't know money, how to tell money. you this. You I don't gamble. <laughs> don't gamble. I haven't gambled since I went to vegas i think it was 2006 i love it and even I love then, everything about gambling i love it i mean you know what i have an aunt who does too like that's kind of her she's widowed now i talk to her pretty regularly she has no kids but she's awesome and um that's her like i think at least once a week she goes to the casino that's her social is this outing. the aunt you talk to on monday nights is this the one yes see yes oh, i like her and what she does on mondays she's so funny like if she's going out and when she goes out on mondays it's usually to the casino and yeah. she'll send me a text and and she'll say okay i'm about to head out so i'm and she's two hours ahead of me so i'll wake up to a text and she's like okay i'm just going out for the day and she signs everything aunt and i'm not gonna put her <laughs> name in but every okay i'm back now aunt blah blah <laughs> <laughs> and it's that's adorable so cute um i love it so much but also like okay yeah i know it's they're poking fun a tiny bit at an old person who's not the most like technically savvy but she was like a badass career woman when nice. it was kind of rebellious to be a badass career woman so yeah i have a i have a lot of respect for her but that's her that's her big thing to do is like go hang out at the casino she's i love it the top tier vip oh wow I'm like i don't <laughs> I'm not want there. to know how much you have to spend for that <laughs> it's spend and win so so keep that in mind too it's also what she wins oh okay well she does win quite often see like more i think more often than not i hear about her coming out ahead Mm, that's good yeah that's rare it's rare but usually mm -hmm. like you have like you're assigned a concierge to you or a host yep. i guess a host yeah her host and then is apparently they, wonderful yeah, see and they like yeah so my parents had a host and they would call her by her first name be like oh yeah mm -hmm. andrea got us tickets to blah 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 and like and i don't know mm -hmm. they're and i'm like who the fuck is andrea like who are these yes. people and then i'm like oh okay so that yeah so i am aware of that oh, yeah. and i do know that it does help when you win because then you get somebody who's like hey come spend your money with us you'll win again come on come oh she's she's given like a certain amount of free slot play all the time yeah yes yes That's so here's a funny story you. do i want to tell you the story i'm going to tell you I the don't story know. <laughs> so back in before 2020 before we shut down like right before i got a uh, a credit card i got a new credit card because I wanted to get, you get a free block room stay in Vegas. And I was going for Clexicon because it was going to be in mm -hmm. uh, Vegas. And so I got this credit card and it gave me a free massive suite, like for the week. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing. I was like, this is the best thing ever. And so, because normally I don't, like I, as you know, I always talk about how I'm such a loyalist mm -hmm. because I have... I have my very first credit card that I ever opened when I was 19 years old. I still have. That I do bitch. too. <laughs> See, so you're a it's loyalist the, it's too. The, it's the backup just in case, right? So then I was like, you know what? They offer like it was it was some sort of MGM credit card, and so they offer points. So I totally forgot about that. Like the world shut down, and then I didn't give a shit about anything. Mm -hmm. and so my sister wanted to do something for my dad on his 80th birthday remember we ended up taking him down to mississippi yeah well i was like you know let me check my credit card or let me check my card because it had some sort of something i couldn't remember what it was mm -hmm. and it was like slot pay so i have 875 dollars in slot play Whoa. <laughs> because of this credit card <laughs> Whoa. Isn't that amazing and that's just based on your you know your spending and i spent i i use my credit card to pay my like cable bills and my phone bills things like that all my bills mm -hmm. are go to that credit card and then i just pay the credit card 
And so doing that for the, over the course of four years has given me $875 or something like that to, to go play. Wow. Play. All right. Yeah. So there so you next go. Next time you go to Vegas. <laughs> next time I go to Vegas, I'm going to probably lose it within an hour, but whatever, it, it would have been fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we had pride. We had, we had herb. Oh, and I went to New York. I went to the Lammies. Mm -hmm. Lambda Literary Awards since Catch was a finalist. Yes. So, and here's the cool thing. Like we didn't know anybody. I was there with Melissa Braden and Georgia Beers who were also nominated uh, or finalists for mm -hmm. the romance category. And so we ended up sitting next to the other two people who were in our category. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it was really, really cool. So we got to meet our whole entire like our whole field mm -hmm. and we got to meet a couple other writers that I did not win uh Georgia won so that was nice that it stayed congratulations within the family. Georgia yeah, Georgia so she won and then we had to sit and wait for two and a half hours for it to be done I was ready to go and they're like absolutely not you have to stick around <laughs> yeah so I was like, eh. That's the one thing, like, I know the Lammies are prestigious and I think yeah. Lambda Literary does really important work. And of course, you know, big caveat, I used to be a staff writer writing mm -hmm. like at the Lambda Literary Review, writing reviews. But when you look at all the categories, it's kind of disjointed because mm -hmm. there's all these like highly literary categories and then it feels like romance is almost wedged in a little bit. Yeah. I mean, and they're very specific, like, like trans nonfiction by age mm -hmm. range this. And you're like, what? And then we get romance. Yeah. <laughs> romance. Yeah. And they have, they have like, they have like 36 categories and they're all extremely specifically queer, mm -hmm. except for the romance. There's gay romance and uh, lesbian romance. Yeah. And, and that's, that's it. it. And I yeah. mean, and I they're do early. Think Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're early. And so you have to sit through it and probably didn't know most of the other, although I do think it's important to call attention to, to these, oh, yeah. like it's a mm -hmm. great, um, it's, it's like a really incredible PR function for right. underrepresented literature. Right. But it does just make it a little wonky for, I think yes. the romance authors. And I get, you know, I get why a lot of people, a lot of people weren't there. They were like, busy doing other things and they just accepted their award via video and it was pre-recorded <laughs> so it wasn't like hey so they knew ahead of time um uh, but the people oh. who were there yeah so there are a lot of people i think romance was the first category who was who was in attendance hmm yes yeah, so i think georgia was the first one that made it up the up to uh accept an award well i think that's also like let's be honest most queer authors, and especially when you get into like niche literary fiction, are not able to live off of their writing. Mm -hmm. um, if you're lucky, you might be eligible for some kind of government grants or something like that. But for the most part, it's like yeah. people that have other jobs. I mean, you do very well as a queer author, but you still have another job. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and, and New York is not cheap. It is not cheap. Yeah. There's nothing about New York that's cheap. Yeah. So I think, unfortunately, that's kind of like it's a, it's a gating factor yeah. for mm -hmm. a lot of people. But it is it is still really cool that they do it. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad they do. Congratulations on being a finalist. Thank and, you. And uh, congrats to Melissa. Also, the other people that I don't remember their names <laughs> and, to, and to Georgia for winning. We did get uh, Melissa and I did get uh, certificates. <laughs> Oh, that's nice. So I, and I kind of like when I got home, I kind of like bent it. So I'm flattening it out. I will frame mm -hmm. it. Cause I mean, it's, it's not every day yeah. you become a finalist for a Lammy. So definitely not. Yeah. So when I was in New York, I also went and, uh, went to Broadway and I saw Gatsby on Broadway. Oh, was it good? It was very good. It was very good. I was, the thing that shocked me the most is that. Mm -hmm. When you hear about something on Broadway, you think, you know, massive, you know, huge lights flashing, blah, 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 Broadway. Mm -hmm. Like the theater was like 1,200 people. Like theaters are very small. The Broadway theaters Whoa. are small. Like here in Missouri, like the smallest theater we have, why, well, I mean, I'm sure the Unicorn's pretty small, but the Midland is a very popular uh, place for plays. And it's like 1,800 or something like that. So I was really mm -hmm. surprised with how small the audiences are for Broadway mm -hmm. show, shows. 
but it was really good. I loved, uh, I loved it so much. It reminded me that um, I should probably go to some more plays here in Kansas city. Cause I had such a good time. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was right out of college, one of my friends would for Christmas every year, she would buy us Missouri rep uh, tickets, season tickets. So we got to see all the plays and we did that for probably like four years or so. Mm-hmm. So I used to love going to play. So seeing Gatsby reminded me of that. Yeah, I did. I do like it and I should do it again. So I'm going to yeah. probably look into plays around here. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's super great. And I know there's a lot going on in my life. <laughs> this is what happens when I miss a month of, of chit chatting. It is a lot. And like you're catching s- everybody up on all the things. I am. I know. So fast forward if you just want to get to the uh, <laughs> to the recommendations. <laughs> but uh, I got my page proofs back for perfect, which is the Good. book I have written with my first non-binary uh, lead. Mm-hmm. So page proofs start. They're due here in a couple of weeks. And then uh, my final book in the sensory series, Gaze, G-A-Z-E, maybe a play on G-A-Y-S. You be the judge. I already uh, have been. I've been making the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was turned into Ashley. And because I have a lot of like she she got some help, I guess, because I have a lot of uh, lawyery stuff in it. Oh, OK. So oh. so now I'm waiting for uh, for paid. I, I'm waiting for content edits back on that. And I will guarantee you set here right now that shit's going to come back to me while I'm at GCLS and I'll have to turn it in while I'm at GCLS. No. Nope. So she's going to make me work. Listen, who do I got to find? I'll be a GCLS. Who do I got to <laughs> yes, find to say, no, it's not. I don't think happening. Ashley's going to be there, but yeah, she's going to. Uh, well, somebody else is. Who's it going to be? <laughs> I'll find them. I don't know that Rod and uh, Sandy are going to be there. So I think ultimately I'm next in line. So I'm oh, the boss. Oh God, is it Rad? <laughs> not really. It's, I don't think I can. I don't think I can go tell Red <laughs> off. I don't have it in me. I think actually Ruth, Ruth will probably be there. I'm I don't sure know her. So I can, Ruth I can. Is sweet. Go be sassy to Ruth, although she might cut off my access to BSB books on NetGalley. Right. You better stop that. Yeah, because she's in charge of that. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. And so that's that's about it, I think. Um, there's there's I'm I have a break yep. right now. I'm I'm not writing. Uh, I don't have a deadline. I'm not pushing towards a deadline. Although I, you and I just had a conversation before we started recording about the new project I'm working on, which mm-hmm. I don't have a contract for yet. So oh friends. Oh, listeners. <laughs> I'm so excited. I am so excited. Just hearing the premise. Yeah. I'm so excited. And I'm not going to tell you anything else. Just know that you yeah. should be excited too, because it is fucking delightful. Oh, I'm it's very going excited. to be great. <laughs> um, and you. speaking of GCLS, this is pro- I think this is our last episode that is dropping before then. Um, so are you going to be there? Let us know. Or yes. just come find, find us. us yeah come f- we'll be there we do not have specific shirts or anything like that to look for but come on you know what <laughs> you know looks like you might know what i look like <laughs> there's enough pictures of me the- look on our website there's photos of us on right, our website right Just, yeah come and find us we would love to see you and hear from you in person what you think about right. the show if you have any ideas all of that so and we're going to be recording from there too and we're gonna be recording from there and I think it's Wednesday afternoon at 3.30. But I think when the new schedule comes out for GCLS, we'll be sure to post it. Yeah. So we're basically going to be doing this in person. Mm-hmm. And we might have people come up and talk to us at the same time. We'll see how it goes. It's yeah. probably going to be fairly free for her. <laughs> yeah. We're, um, we're just going to wing it probably. I'll start yeah. drinking about one. <laughs> Holy shit. <So>. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Maybe. I don't even know what I have on the schedule for Wednesday. So I need to check because I've got some, I've got things going on like all week. Um, oh, I should also oh. probably say that's a great point. So you're going to be on a couple of other panels. I'm also going to be on a panel. If you're inclined yeah. to check that out, I'm going to be on the, on the panel about reviewing. So if you want to come and hear me talk about book reviewing, go mm-hmm. to that. I'm see, mm-hmm. I'm so bad at this promo <laughs> <laughs> oopsie yes go see tara she's great 
And go see Chris because she's great too. Yay. Go see us. See and us. I don't think we're I don't think we're on panels at opposite times. So I will be at Chris's panels. Yay. And Chris and might be, be at the bar during my <laughs> Well, I'll I'll just bring a drink with me and I'll I'll be sure to like not Amazing. Like... <laughs> I'll be and there. If I'm not if I'm not doing great, just hand me the drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, this might have been our longest preamble ever, and I love it. Probably. I feel caught up this feels good. good but what i'm not caught up on is chris what yes. have you been reading or watching lately there has been a lot so uh, a lot of the programs i i was watching they signed off for the summer so they're um mm -hmm. yeah so they've ended but alone is back alone hey. is back i love it so not only is alone back but alone australia is also uh, it's like on the right after it so I get like four hours of alone on Thursday. Mm -hmm. So just know I'm not answering your texts. I'm not answering your calls. If you try to call me or text me on Thursdays, because that is all about alone. So I'm super excited mm -hmm. about it. And it just started. So I don't know like how many, and it, there's always queer people on alone, always. And so they, are they openly queer though? Yeah, 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 yeah. They're like, oh, oh here's my family. And yeah, I'm not outing anybody. They are like, they show videos of back home, what home life mm. is like. And I want to say they haven't really, they just kind of brushed on it. I think this one lady does have a partner. Uh, okay. Cause so, those first few seasons were very not queer. I yeah. mean, there was a, there was a trans woman, but it wasn't discussed at all. Mm. And I will say that the House of the Dragon started up, season two started up. So there's total queerness, and there always has been, mm -hmm. with uh, Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon. So, like, last year when I watched season one, like, mm -hmm. I wasn't a fan. Yeah, I was yeah. still kind of, like, hurt because Game of Thrones ended, and that just hurt everybody's heart. And then mm -hmm. when, when it came on, it really wasn't that exciting. Like House of the Dragon wasn't exciting until yeah. the very last episode. And that hooked me. And I was like, oh my God, that oh, mm -hmm. I'm hooked. So the new season started. I don't remember jack shit from the first season. <laughs> like I tried to do a YouTube, like, you know how they do the, uh -huh, the recap, like, recaps, like a 10 yeah. minute recap. I'm like, I was lost. I was like, I don't even know these people. I don't know who these people are. Yeah. So what I did was all week, every night I watched an episode of House of the Dragon season one. Mm -hmm. So I finished that up. And then last night I watched the first episode of season two. And I think the second episode of season two comes on tonight. So I am caught up. Nice. Yes. So yes. Yeah, so there is queerness for sure. Um, mm -hmm. So there's also a lot of incestuous stuff too. So be aware. Right. Oh, Look at your face. Yeah. I know. Ooh. I know. And it's Gross. like, I, you know, and I'm just like, is that how it was? I think that's how it was way back when the royalty, you know, you, you, you hooked up with cousins. I don't and know. I mean, true. here's the thing. George R. R. Martin was in, in defending all the rape in his books he was like well, oh. that's how it was back then and it's like okay but counterpoint there also were not dragons back then so perhaps we can imagine <laughs> a world we without... can pretend, yeah yeah can we imagine a version of history without right. rape and incest so one of the guys thing to consider <laughs> right one of the guys that I used to work with he's retired now but he was very extremely religious but he couldn't find a religion that worked for him so I knew him for almost 25, over 25 years, actually. And so, he, okay. you know, what religion are you this, this week? What religion are you next week? You know, just, he just, he couldn't find one that fit for him. And I remember asking him, like, at what point was it not okay? You know, because in the Bible, brothers and sisters had sex, mm -hmm. they had babies, you know, at what point was it not okay? And his response to me was, well, God told them it wasn't okay anymore. And so they stopped having sex with their siblings because I'm like, literally, how, like, how did that happen? And so, yeah, so that was the explanation I was given just because God said so. I'm like, OK, all right, you go with that. But and that's kind of so because of that, I was I've always been thinking about that. And then mm -hmm. here comes House of Dragons and Game of Thrones, where there's a lot of incestual relationships. So, yeah, yeah. I keep thinking back to that. So anyway, not an excuse. That's, did you. Uh, so in your in your in your month of uh -huh. being away doing things did you watch the new bridgerton season of course i did do you want to talk about that 
we can't because isn't there a little bit of queerness in it there is a little bit of queerness in it there's i mean i feel like i have talked about everything because it's yeah it's been a month but yeah bridgerton Mm -hmm. has queerness in it uh actually one of the bridgertons Hmm. i know did you watch it no i haven't watched any of it god jesus i can't believe you (laughs) haven't seen any of it it's so good and here's the Uh funny thing i the one thing i absolutely adore about bridgerton is that is the music because they take modern day songs and they make it sound like, you know, they put the yeah. classical thing to it. And then you sit there and you're like, why do I know the song? And you start mm-hmm. singing the words to it, even though there aren't words, it's all instrumental. Yeah. But I'm like, this is Taylor Swift. Yeah. <laughs> like they yeah, have yeah. so many good, mu- they have so many good songs. So I really love it for the music, but I, I also love the whole entire, just like everything, what's going on. Mm-hmm. And like, mm-hmm. I was surprised. I like this season better than last season. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. So that's I good. did like, yeah. So it hasn't gotten worse for me. It's gotten better. I mean, that's you can't beat the first want. season of Bridgerton because it was so original and unique and different and mm-hmm. and it was so good. And then uh, second season was, or no, I think Queen Charlotte. I don't know when Queen Charlotte came out. It came out either after the second season or before the second season, but that was a pretty good one. Pretty queer one. Um, mm-hmm. And then this, this season of Bridgerton is queer and I, I kind of love it. I kind of like, I like the direction it's going in. Yeah. So I hope that by the next season that it explores it more. I think I saw a headline indicating that it's oh, supposed to. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, because uh-huh. I'm, I'm down. Like, why wasn't I born then? Oh, that's <laughs> right. Because I have rights now, sort of. Uh, kind of. Yeah. You, again, would have died either in childbirth or shitting out your eyeballs because of uh, not enough medication. Right. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Okay, my gosh, enough about me. What about you? What have you been reading or watching or what is new in your life? All right, so I have been watching RuPaul's Drag Race Mm All-Stars Season 9. Woo! Yay! So this is a non-elimination season again, which- Oh, cool. I love because, you know, so much gets invested in the runway looks. And so when somebody is sent home like one or two weeks in and you know they have a ton of like- fancy incredible drag because these are all queens that have been there before Mm -hmm. and they're getting to come back and show how much they've grown but the thing that i think is really cool is that this season they're actually not playing so that they win two hundred thousand dollars they're playing for charity oh nice yeah oh i love that they each have their own charities there's like the trevor project there's trans lifeline there's aspca national association of mental illness a bunch of others that i'm the black justice coalition and i can't remember the others And it's just like, I really like this cast. It's a really strong cast. I'm having a ton of fun with all of it. I don't, I almost don't care who wins. (laughs) Like there are a a good cause. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are a couple that I think are absolutely front runners, but it almost doesn't matter because it's just fun. And like every, almost every challenge is excellent. Like they had probably the best roast of any season ever. Nobody was terrible. Everybody was either good or excellent. Like it was, ah. this is a great season. If you haven't been back to drag race in a while, this all-star season might be a fun one to jump back in on. And then I played a video game. It only it was only about five or six hours, but it's called strange horticulture. Oh, and it is a game where it's, it's basically a, a game where you have a job. It's like a job simulator, but your job is that you are a horticulturalist um, (laughs) and you do all these herbs and stuff for making potions or for healing people or whatever. And there's like this whole occult backstory and you're trying to match like these plants you have on a shelf. It sounds so nerdy. And it is. It's very (laughs) nerdy. (laughs) But also I was like, oh, I have purpose. Okay, they're looking for something and I'm going to try to find the plant for them. And then you get to go out and you get like, it's a very contained game like i said it's quite short and you're not seeing all these different locations or anything like that but there's something about the singular vision that the creators had that i really respect because Hmm. they knew exactly what they were doing and they decided to do just enough to do that no more and they knocked it out of the park wow yeah i played it last weekend really enjoyed it not queer at all doesn't really matter I mean, I don't, it's not, I wouldn't call it straight either. Like, it's just kind of like, that has nothing to do with it. Right. And then I read your Lammy co-finalist, Melissa Braden, her latest book, When You Smile. Mm -hmm. 
and it was really good the taboo book the taboo book yes so when taryn was 11 she had a gigantic crush on her babysitter charlie charlie was 16 at the time and that's kind of the first chapter is seeing like one of their babysitter night things and then comes back to where we are now in the present 10 years later Taryn is a transfer student at a university. So she did a couple of years of of college and now she's going to this university um, and she is hammered at a frat party with some of her new friends and is unexpectedly helped by Charlie. Who knew they're at the same place (laughs) Um, because they hadn't, they hadn't been in touch in between. Right. I don't know my babysitters. Well, and like Charlie babysat her for a summer and then her family moved away to a whole other state. So Mm -hmm. like there was no staying in touch or anything like that. And so there's just this, it's really cute. There's this, Taryn's really drunk and she's like, wait, I think I know you, Charlie, were you my babysitter? (laughs) It was adorable. And um, so Charlie is a graduate student in a writing program. She has a long-term boyfriend, Danny. He's in the program too. His mom used to be her mom's best friend. His mom is also a super famous author. So it's all this kind of like, look at, she's being set up for the perfect future. But as she and Taryn kind of reconnect and they become friends and she starts to have this like, why do I like spending time with Taryn more than I like spending time with Danny? (laughs) And then there's Uh, this like, yeah, oh no. So of course the choice is, do I take, you know, this path that's very clearly been laid out for me? That's very easy. Or do I choose for myself? And go explore something that doesn't have the same kind of sure, sureness to it, but it sure is a lot more exciting. As soon as I heard the premise, I was very excited because I don't (laughs) think I've heard anything quite like it before. Like there's definitely, you know, dating the nanny books, like you wrote one, Chelsea Cameron has one. Yeah. But I don't think there is any like, yeah, she used to be my babysitter and I had a crush on her. (laughs) And so... I can see how some people might be a little concerned about that as a premise, but I do think Mm -hmm. it helps that like, there's only five years between them when they babysat, like Taryn was 11 at the time. And now that they're older, like they're definitely on more equal footing. Like, yes, one of them is an undergraduate student. The other one is a graduate student, but both adults, they're both exactly. They're both adults. Like Taryn is also not a freshman. She has a couple of years of college under her belt. So she knows what it's like even just being in higher education. And I thought it worked really well because it also meant that they, they had a little bit of a foundation because they're, they knew each other before. Yes. A lot's happened in 10 years. They both grew up, but there is kind of that familiarity of like, oh yeah, Mm -hmm. we knew each other at one point in our lives and they build a friendship on top of that. And then that Mm -hmm. friendship turns into a romance. Um, it was really, I don't know. It worked for me. The chemistry was really, really good. And we see like Taryn is totally anguishing because she's like, oh fuck, I have a crush on this straight person. Mm. This is horrible. But then at the same time, Charlie's just so confused and it's very cute. The other thing I love about this book, of course, there's like a little breakup scene in there somewhere, Mm -hmm. you know? Melissa Braden loves breaking up. Oh, she's horrible. She loves to break up her characters. She loves to put them in turmoil and anguish and all that. Um, But this book has an excellent grovel sequence. Oh, good. It's so good. I forgot how much I love a good grovel in fiction. (laughs) And I haven't seen one this good in years and years. So. If you also love a good grovel, this is definitely a great one to check out. So I loved it. I love the characters. It was super fun. I read it in a few days. So if you want something sweet and sexy and mm. like just enough, it wasn't like so much angst to like punch me in the face and keep right. punching for days, <laughs> but it was enough to keep it like really interesting and yeah. make that grovel make sense. Mm-hmm. Go get it. This was very nearly my official recommendation. And then, well. I read another also excellent book. Oh, see, so so it was hard. Yeah, so I'm cheating. I still recommend it. I just put it over (laughs) in the what I've been reading section. (laughs) Good deal. (laughs) Chris, what's your official recommend? Wait, choking on my own spit. (laughs) Hold on. 
Hold okay. that thought. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay. So my official recommendation is a book by E.J. Noyes called Turbulence. Ooh, I've heard good things about this one. Yes, it's very, very good. Uh, it was a 2017 release. And here's the synopsis. Stockbroker Isabel Rhodes has a lot of money, a lot of trust issues, and a lot of reasons to believe her ex-girlfriend was right when she said that Isabel sucked at relationships. With that accusation stuck in her head, Isabel throws caution to the wind and dives into her first one-night stand. Checking that off her bucket list should be something to celebrate, except it turns out that the woman she just spent an earth-shattering night with is actually her newly hired company pilot, Audrey Graham. Mm. Oops. <laughs> yep. Ms. Never See You Again just turned into Miss See You, Ms. See You Constantly. Concerned about the stigma of workplace dalliances, Isabel vows it can't go further than one night. Good plan, if not for an insistent libido and an even more persistent Audrey who conspires to break Isabel's resolve. Soon their no-strings arrangement starts to feel a lot like dating, and Isabel finds herself wanting more than just casual nights together. Mm. Dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. So I love this book. Not because, I mean, it was written so well and it made me laugh constantly, uh, but there was a surprising amount of depth to it. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, like, why is everybody afraid to commit? You know, why, why mm -hmm. is, is, is he, is, is, she has several names. So it's Isabel, is, is he, like, why is she so afraid to let people in? Mm -hmm. so and so let's be real like the very first sentence reeled me in and i'm going to say the first sentence and i actually wanted to read the first paragraph but okay. i'm only going to read the first sentence and okay. it made me laugh like i literally laughed out loud the very first sentence okay okay for the first time in months the hand fondling my breast was not mine <laughs> <laughs> i love that <laughs> that's pretty good that's yes. very good that's very good so and i love that ej gives her characters flaws and, you know, because we've talked about this before, you know, I spend the very first several books, I wanted to write perfect characters. And I love mm -hmm. it when they have flaws. I didn't realize how mm -hmm. much I loved it until I started reading more and more. And so for sure, her characters are still super likable, but have issues, and they are flawed. And I love that. So like you have this ultra rich stockbroker, she has, she has the best of everything. Like she has people who come to her house to dress her. She has people put on her makeup. Uh, she even has a driver and she has all these big events that happen weekly almost, you know, so wow. she's always like always on the go, like always doing events, always doing fundraisers. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't know when she sleeps, but <laughs> the thing is she does not have old money. She has new money. And that has always kind of weighed on her oh, yeah, and see, okay. and I just saw Gatsby yeah. on Broadway. So I'm even more aware of old money versus new money. So yeah. Yeah. yeah so we're, when I reviewed this book, I was like, oh yeah, that's right. There's this whole new money versus old money and how it plays even in today's book still. Like some people mm -hmm. like that's a thing. So Basically, Izzy gets dumped several months ago, and she's now on the sex-only train until she isn't. Audrey rocks her world and is the most caring, loving friends with benefits partner anyone can have. And by the way, I'm next in line <laughs> if it doesn't work out for them. So I'm next in line. So it's a spicy book that dives deep into each of the MC's reasons for not wanting to commit. And they work through it. And of course, you know, communication is key. Like Always. that's just typical. So, and, but I love mm -hmm. the way it was handled. A lot of times people don't, they either go too far in explaining commitment issues or they don't go far enough. Yeah. And so EJ had just the right amount of explanation. She did a great job of creating these characters. And what's cool is, is like these characters are pulled into a million different ways, like throughout life and mm -hmm. during this whole entire, like the book. There's like all these threads of different storylines going on with, with the characters and she ties yeah. them up nicely. You know, nothing is left unanswered. I don't have any questions. I, I, you know, reviewing the book, I was just like, oh yeah, that's right. This is great. There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this yeah. book. It's a great romance. So like the, with the characters, they have a fear of failure, at least Izzy mm -hmm. does. You know, and that's a big thing for people, a fear of failure, especially Huge. people who are like massively in control of, of big corporations or have a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or just, you know, people who like people who are control freaks, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So 
loss of control, fear of failure, fear of abandonment even. So there's, mm-hmm. there's a lot going on, but you don't even realize it until you, you're done with the book. And then you think about it and you're like, oh yeah, that's right. Oh yeah, she talks about this and she talks about that. So it's really, really good. Like AJ is a great writer, hands down, has deserved every award she's ever won. Like I have great admiration for her mm-hmm. um, and I laugh out loud. And I can't tell you, that is hard for me to laugh out loud in books. Yes. You know, I might like smile, like, hmm, oh, that was clever. But mm-hmm. like for me to like literally laugh out loud, people look at me like, what are you reading? Like what it, that, like, I love that, that she can d- do that for me. Yes, so, I love that. And, and there's also a ton of sex on the page. So if you like spicy books, like EJ goes there, like she mm-hmm. goes there and you know, and I just, uh, it's very, you know, sex positive and fun. And if you haven't read any of EJ noise, then I do recommend Turbulence. I think it's fun. She does have a, a couple of series that are out that mm-hmm. I haven't finished, so I can't. I mean, I'm sure they're going to be great, but I mean, if you're not like in the military, if you're not into like yeah. spy, you know, just this is a really good fresh book to start with, I think, and mm-hmm. that'll kind of get you on the uh, on the EJ train. So, yeah. So that was my official recommendation. Um, what about you, Tara? What is your official recommendation? Okay, so mine is One and Done by Frederick Smith. And it starts with Dr. Taylor James. He lives in, he's not a medical doctor. He's like a PhD kind of doctor. He lives in San Francisco and he has a dream. He wants to be the first fairly young, he's in his forties. He wants to be the first fairly young queer black man to be a university president in the U S and you know, he's kind of, he's well on his way. Cause right now he is the vice president of the campus that he's at he is leading his university's reaccreditation process which is always like a gnarly difficult right. thing to do so when he just gets this one thing done he will be good he will be ready to start applying for those kinds of positions but sundays are not work days and so he mm-hmm. is at the gay bar Bo in the castro district district for a sunday fun day brunch Bo actually is a real bar which was kind of cool to see when i went and, and looked oh, it up cool. yeah Unfortunately, this incredibly beautiful but arrogant jerk keeps hitting on him. And, and uh, he's like, go away. And then the <laughs> next day, when Taylor meets with the consultants who oh. have come to town that will be <laughs> assessing him for the reaccreditation, he comes face to face with none other than the arrogant jerk himself, Dr. Dustin McMillan, also not mm. a medical doctor. <laughs> um, <laughs> Taylor doesn't want to work with Dustin and tries to get Dustin off the project, but it doesn't work. He doesn't have a choice. And But Dustin wants to do a lot more than just work with Taylor on the project. But Dustin's not really looking for love. He got out of the Bay Area for a lot of reasons. He doesn't want to come back. But the more time they spend together, the more Taylor learns that Dustin's not a jerk. And Dustin learns that maybe some things actually are worth coming back home for. So mm. it's really a question of, can they get out of their own way long mm. enough to take that chance at love. I really enjoyed this one. And I was excited to read about it because it is about Black queer men falling in love and it's actually written by a Black queer man. Like, I'm not going to get deeply into this, but I I think it's pretty well known that a lot of gay romance is written by women, often for other women. So I think this is important. Yes. When I was at Pride and had the booth, a lot of women were always they were going straight for the gay romance they wanted Mm -hmm. i straight (laughs) all the women were going were were thumbing through and buying and getting the uh the gay books yeah so they also read them too yeah it's been like it's gosh i mean i was i read some before i discovered lesbic like it's a thing that's been happening for probably like 15 years or more and Mm. and it is like it is mostly women writing for women. And so I think it's really um, important to pick up some of the books that oh, gay, sure. that yeah. gay men are writing. Oh, yeah. And I think especially in this case, the fact that it's actually like a black gay man who's writing, love it. Love it. I was so excited. <laughs> and I talked about one of Frederick Smith's other books, Easy Ain't the Half of It, which he co-wrote with somebody else. I think it was last year, but this is the first book I've read by him that's like just written by him that he didn't co-write. Mm. So. This was a really fun opposites attract romance because I feel like this is not unlike some of what you just talked about, but Taylor is laser focused on his career. That's like for him, he's so like his, he has this goal in mind so much. 
he makes time for fun at the drag brunches, but that's really kind of mostly it. You don't have a lot of time when you're in university administration to do other things. But then on the other hand, you know, you have uh, Dustin who is more fun loving, except he is also kind of cagey. He at first is cagey about the fact that like, he says his name is DJ. And then his cousin, who is a drag queen, <laughs> kind of wanders by and is like, "Hey, Dustin, you're home. What are you doing?" And this guy's like, "Dustin, so you're just so what? Like you're doing? You're using different names? Uh, like what's uh-huh. happening?" And then also it, it comes out that like, "Oh, you're not just from out of town. You're from around here. Why? So you're a liar? Right. Like what's yeah. happening like that?" And so that really bothers Taylor. And Dustin doesn't understand why it matters because he's just looking for a one night stand. So if he's looking for a one night stand, why does he need to share kind of right. these like right. more personal details? But then it turns out that like some of this plays into kind of who they are and their backstory. And so there are other things that they're opposite in too. So Taylor has a really good relationship with his family and, and especially his parents. Dustin doesn't have a great relationship mm. with his family. That was kind of part of why he he got out of town. He also has like an ex in his past that he's not proud of. That's actually still living in the place that he owns in the area. (laughs) Well, so it sounds like it was one of those like convenient pandemic relationships Mm. and the sex was good and all that was great. Except then he found out that this person voted for Trump and was like, I got to get the fuck out of town and move to Chicago. But like the relationship he has with his family now is more financial than anything else. But we see Mm. kind of through the story how they sort of influence each other. We see Taylor, you know, he has to go on his journey of, can I want something more than this particular job title? And Dustin is able to start, you know, having a little bit more of a relationship with his mom and, and maybe he can build relationships with other family um, members. Also, also, mm. also for people mm. who love the tropes, I think mm. it's important to note that there is a only one bed situation. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that happens in this book and it's pretty great. And at the beginning, like in that first chapter and they're at Bo, they're at this bar and they kept talking about Sunday fun day and it kept coming up as a term over and over. And I was like, okay, so is this just like a thing in the Castro? Like, is this... I don't know. So I went and Google searched it. And that was how I found out that Bo is actually like a real gamer oh, there. Yeah. Which I thought was really cool. And Taylor, there's a side character who this guy is basically his brother. Um, his parents like ended up adopting him after the after the guy's mom passed away. And he's a one of his kind of several jobs he has is he's a bartender at Bo, especially like on Sundays for these drag brunches and I really loved, there was a point near the end of the book where it called out that this character specifically, like it's, it's yes, the bar, but also specifically this character as a bartender works really hard to make it a safe space for proudly black, openly Mm. queer men to be and to come together. And I really appreciated that because, you know, different groups do need a place where they can go and Mm -hmm. just be themselves. And then there's also an interesting part in the epilogue. These two facts are very different, but the way I see them tied is that they they both have like somewhat of a social message that kind of underpins what's happening in the book. So in the epilogue, it comes up about how much money a university president can make. And we see how that can be criticized. And at first I was a little surprised because it looked like there was this almost justification for how someone can make a half million dollar salary. Wow. Cause that's like, that is a ginormous a amount of money. And like, yes, absolutely. University presidents work very hard, but so do people that work three jobs at a service industry to, right. you know, scrape by. Right. But it was in that part where we also see a nod toward what happened with Claudine Gay at Harvard university earlier this year. Did you hear about that? I was just Googling it now. So... Uh... Three presidents of universities, Claudine Gay was one of them, were called up before Congress Mm. to talk about basically like, are you doing enough to make sure Jewish students feel safe Mm. with some of the pro-Palestinian speech? This was before Uh. the protests, before anything like that. But she in particular had also been uh, singled out in the media. And there were some people that were 
combing through her very old scholarship and trying to claim that she was plagiarizing when what she actually was doing was paraphrasing. Paraphrasing uh, is incredibly common in academic writing. She was not doing anything outside the normal, but it was so like, it was just such an egregiously awful campaign against her for no real reason other than that mm -hmm. she was a black woman who's president at a prestigious university and she ended up resigning. And I thought that point was huge mm. because it was almost this like, how dare this black woman collect this salary and have mm. this prestigious position. And so it's not like a main focus of the book at all, but I think it was a really important point to bring in because it does to a certain extent show what's at stake for Taylor if he's oh, going to be president right. of a university, he is going to have extra scrutiny on him. He is going to have to be way better than anyone else. And it's going to be really difficult. And so I think for me, like at the end of the day with this book, the romance is really sweet. The chemistry is fabulous. I love the characters. Mm -hmm. I love the side characters. It all worked really, really well for me. And what makes it special and pushes it over the top is that it's also grounded in these small moments where we have to remember what's actually at stake for Taylor and Dustin mm. as they are out with their love for each other. Mm. There's not a lot of safe spaces for proud Black queer men. There's going to be a target on Taylor if he's president of a university just mm. because of the intersections of his identity but also it's a lovely romance too mm. that you just feel like so beautiful <laughs> about and you feel like bathed in this love for them and it's so wonderful so yeah i absolutely recommend one and done by frederick smith and nice. i need to figure out what's the next book i'm going to read by him because i know that he has a backlist and i need mm. to check out more of it nice nice so that is all for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us. If you've made it this far, if you haven't subscribed yet, I don't know why you haven't, but please do hit that subscribe button right. so that you have it right in your app when we release a new episode. Again, if you have a friend that you think would like this show, please tell them all about it. And if you want to support us, we do have the links to our coffee or our Substack where you can sign up for a paid subscription if you are so inclined. Or if you want to connect with us on your favorite social media sites, we have links in the show notes for that as well. Or you can just search for Queerly Recommended on most social media sites or email us at podcast at queerlyrecommended.com. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>